This conference will now be recorded. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll discuss the important green top guideline, which are about the reducing risk of the VTE during pregnancy and preparium. And the second uh, guideline is also about the acute management of the uh, Srimbrim blink disease in pregnancy and preparium. Okay, let us also start the first uh, guideline about reducing the risk of VTE during pregnancy and preparium. Pulmonary embolism remains the leading direct cause of maternal death in the UK. So it is the most important direct cause of the maternal death in the UK. It's the first cause. And the incidence of the pulmonary embolism is about 1.3 per 10,000 maternities. This is about the incidence of VE in the UK. And the incidence of VTE, venous thromboembolism, in pregnancy and periperium of 1.122 per 1,000. This is very important uh, figure about, uh, came in the exam, so don't confuse about the incidence of BE and incidence of VTE. So here is the incidence of VTE. Here is the incidence of pulmonary embolism is about 1.3 and here 1 to 2 and VT is 1 to 2. Per 10,000 and here is per 1,000. So here is the difference between the incidence of BE and incidence of VTE. So it is, this is a the call question. So remember, please remember the incidence of BE is 1.3 per 10 cents. And the incidence of VTE is about 1 to 2 per 1,000. So here's the difference between the incidence of BE and the incidence of VTE. And the incidence of BE is 1.3 per 10,000. And the incidence of VTE is 1 to 2 per 1,000. Uh, what about the relative risk of VTE? What does it mean by relative risk? Relative risk is mean the probability of the outcome in exposure group to the outcome or in unexposed groups. So this is the relative risk. And the relative risk of the VTE in pregnancy is four to six fold. It's about four to six fold. And the recurrence of the VTE in pregnancy and postpartum is 2 to 11 percent. So this is the important point related to the exam. Okay. What about the pre-pregnancy and antenatal risk assessment? All women should undergo a documented assessment of risk factor for VTE in early pregnancy or preparing. So all women should undergo a documented assessment risk factor for VTE, pre-pregnancy and early pregnancy and admission to the hospital, postpartum and immediately postpartum. So risk assessment should be repeated if a woman is admitted to the hospital for any reason or develop other inter current problem. Any woman with four or more current risk factors other than the previous VTE or thrombophilia should be considered for reflected low molecular weight heparin throughout the antenatal period and will usually require reflected low molecular weight heparin for six weeks postnatally, but postnatal risk assess assessment should be made. What about the risk factor for VTE? 
This is about risk of VTE, pre-exist risk factor, and obstetric risk factor, and transient risk factor. So this is very important. And the pre-exist risk factor, this, if there's any previous history of VTE, except a single event related to the major surgery. Any previous VTE not related to the major surgery can be score four. So will be a score four. So here we'll score the risk factor as four, three, two, one. And the management here is different. We'll talk the next in the table, how to manage the patient score four, score three, score two, and score one. So you should know about the risk factor and the score of the risk factor. A previous VTE performed by major surgery is classified as score three. And non-high risk thrombophilia is the score three. And it, uh, this is medical comorbidity by cancer, heart failure, ESLE, and inflammatory thrombosis, and inflammatory bowel disease, and skill cell disease. This is classified as score three. So, what about the other? If there's family history of amber fogged or strategy related VTE in first degree relative, this classify as score one, only score one. And non low risk thrombophilia, and there's no VTE, this is the score one. And the age, the age is very important if more than 36 years or if 36 and above. This is a score one. And obesity here, uh, a risk is related to the BMI. If BMI is set or more, it's score one. So be careful about the uh, age and body and BMI, okay? Look for BMI is more than set or more, this is score one. And BMI 40 or more, this is a score two. So a BMI more than 40 and above, give score two, and BMI less than 30 and above, score one. If it's patient uh, smoker, score one. Gross varicose vein is a score one. About the obstetric risk factors, preeclampsia is current pregnancy, score one, and ART, multiple pregnancy, cesarean section is a score two. This emergency drain section and uh, elective drain section score one, mid cavity or rotational operative delivery. So here, it is look uh, mid cavity or rotational operative delivery. This is the only classified as one. So if you give you a scenario, the patient uh, have uh, delivered by forceps. Look for the type of the forceps. If Mid cavity or rotational operative, give her score one. Prolonged labor, more than 24 hours. Uh, postpartum hemorrhage, preterm stillbirth is score one. Transient risk factors, any surgical proceeds. Patient have ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in the first trimester. This is score four. And hyperemesis is a score three. And any surgical proceeds in pregnancy, like abendicectomy, postpartum sterilization, score three, and immobility dehydration, score one. So this is about uh, classification of the risk factor according to the score, score four, score three, score two, and score one. Here, what about how to manage the patient risk factors have score four or more than four or three or two or more. So patient have score risk is more than four antenatally. There is recommended antenatal high dose of low molecular weight heparin and at least six weeks postnatal low molecular weight heparin or until switch it back to oral anticoagulant threat. So is the patient high risk? What does it mean by more than four? Score more than four. This is if there is any previous VTE 
and previous VTE with antithrombin deficiency or with antiphospholipid syndrome or the other thrombophilia. So if any previous VTE and associated with one of the three, antithrombin deficiency or antiphospholipid syndrome or other thrombophilia, this is should be give high dose, high dose of low molecular weight heparin. And what about the score for for antenatally, like previous VTE, except a single event related to the major surgery, if there is antithrombin deficiency or ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in the first trimester. If you found one of the three previous VTE not related to surgery, or anti thrombin deficiency or uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, this is score four and antenatal prophylactic low molecular weight heparin and at least six week postnatal low molecular weight heparin. Here's the difference between more than four and four here about the high dose of low molecular weight heparin. Three antenatally, three antenatally like previous VTE related to the surgery or provoked by major surgery, or there is non-high risk thrombophilia. If this patient have high risk thrombophilia, like deficiency of the protein S and protein C, and if there is homogeneous uh, factor V dense and these other types, this is about non-high risk thrombophilia, or there is medical comorbidities, like cancer, heart failure, or any surgery proceeds in the pregnancy, or preparium like a septomy or hypermesis gravidarum during hospital admission. So this is the class five score three and thromboflaxis from 28 and at least six week postnatal low molecular weight heparin weeks. And if it's score two or more postnatally, so give her thromboflaxis for at least 10 days. Is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. So any woman with two current risk factors other than previous VTE or thrombophilia should be considered for prophylactic low mercury heparin for at least 10 days. Postpartum. Women admitted to the hospital when pregnant, including the gynecology ward with hyperemesis gravidarum or ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, should usually be over thromboflaxis with low mercury weight heparin unless there is specific contraindication such as risk of labor or active bleeding. A single previous VTE woman with previous VTE should be over pre pregnancy counseling and prospect management plan for thromboflaxis in pregnant men. Women with previous VTE, except those with a single previous VTE related to major surgery and no other risk factor, should be over thromboflaxis with low mercury heparin through the antenatal period. This is, a, this is about summary of the previous table. Uh, what about the thrombophilia associated type of thrombophilia? Treatable thrombophilia, as you know, there's two types of thrombophilia is treatable or acquired thrombophilia. Inherited thrombophilia like activated protein C and factor B leading mutation and prothrombin and antithrombin deficiency and protein S and C, C deficient. This is treatable thrombophilia. So, women with previous VTE associated with antithrombin deficiency who will often be a long term on oral anticoagulation should be offered. 
thrombophylaxis with high dose. So this is mentioned in this uh, previous table, more than four score for antenatally. So give her high dose of low molecular weight heparin, either 50, this is the exam question, or 75 or full treatment dose. It's about dose, high dose should be 50 or 75 percent or full treatment dose antenatally and for six week postpartum or until return to the oral anticoagulant therapy after delivery this is about patient have previous vte with associated with antithrombi deficiency so this is more than a score for management should be undertaken in collaboration with hematologists with expertise in thrombosis in bringness and consideration given to antenatal anti it's a monitoring and potential for antithrombin replacement and initiation of labor or prior to cesarean section. If anti XA level as measured, a test should does not use genus antithrombin should be used and four hours big level of 0.5 to one international unit mil M4. So if this patient is high dose or anti therapeutic dose, should be the aim of anti XA is 0.5 to 1 international per mil. Other hip troubles, uh, thrombophilic defect, are lower risk and can be managed with standard dose of thromboflexis. What about acquired thrombophilia? Women's VT associated with antiphospholipid syndrome who will open on the long-term oral anticoagulant should be over it a thromboflaxis with high dose low medical weight heparin either 50, 75 percent or full treatment dose antenatal and for six weeks postpartum or anti return to the oral anticoagulant therapy after delivery. This is the same more than four score for antenatal. So we give her patient with previous VTE and associated with antiphospholipid syndrome, give her high dose of levonucleotide heparin. Brevenal woman with antiphospholipid syndrome is prior VTE or arterial thrombosis should be many collaboration with hematologist and or rheumatologist with expertise in this area. So if you give patient high dose of levonucleotide heparin, should be followed or managed by hematologist. Previous recurrent VTE, what about the previous recurrent VTE? So we women give advice for women. Regarding the dose of lemocotibrin in the pregnancy should be soft from the clinician scubertis in hematology, hemostasis and pregnancy. So we need clinician have experience with hemostasis and pregnancy. Women on long-term warfarin or oral anticoagulant should be concerned about the risk of this agent to the fetus. And advice to stop their anticoagulant therapy and change to low molecular weight heparin as soon as possible in pregnancy is confirmed. I deal with in two weeks of missed period and before the six weeks of pregnancy. So patient on warfarin should be stopped because this is uh, teratogenics and can lead to fetal warfarin syndrome or embryo basi. And this is occurred okay, during the first trimester. So you should stop, if you confirm the pregnancy, you should stop the warfarin. Women not on warfarin or the other oral anticoagulant should be advised to start low molecular weight heparin as soon as they have a positive pregnant test. So women if have previous recurrent VTE and not on other anticoagulant should be advised to start low molecular weight heparin as soon as they have a positive pregnant test. Yes. 
What about stratification of women with previous VTE? And how should women with previous VTE be stratified to the termine management embryo? So, women with VTE associated with their antithrombin, with either antithrombin deficiency or antiphospholipid syndrome, or with recurrent VTE, who will be a long term oral anticoagulant, should be over thromboflaxis with high dose low molecular weight heparin, either 50, 75, or full treatment dose. Antenatally, and for six week postpartum or anti-retail to the oral anticoagulant therapy after delivery. Women with who in the original VTE was umbrophobic or idiopathic or related to the estrogen, estrogen containing contraception pregnancy or related to transient risk factor other than major surgery or who have other risk factors should be over it, thromboflaxis with low molecular weight heparin throughout the antenatal period. In women with, in women in who the original VTE was performed by major surgery, from which they have recovered and who have no risk other factors, thromboflaxis with low microbial heparin can be with halt antenatally until 28 weeks. So the score three provide no additional risk factor and present in which case they should be over it, low microbial heparin. So this is about score three antenatally. So what about testing of for thrombophilia in women with previous VTE? Prior to testing for thrombophilia, women should be counseled regarding the implication for themselves and family members of a positive or negative result. And the result should be presented by clinician with specific expertise in this area. Women with a family history of VTE and either antithrombin deficiency or where the specific thrombophilia has not been detected should be tested for antithrombin deficiency. Women with amplified VTE should be tested for the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. What about asymptomatic treatable thrombophilia? Women with asymptomatic antithrombin protein C or S deficiency, or those with more than one thrombophilic defect, including homogeneous, homozygous factor V leading, homozygous parathrombic gene mutation, and compound heterozygous, should be all referred to the local expert and antenatal prophylaxis considered. They should be recommended for six weeks postnatal prophylaxis, even in the absence of additional risk factors. So, this patient is asymptomatic, treatable thrombophilia should be referred to the expert of, for the consideration for prophylaxis. Heterozygosities for factor deedens or prothrombin G mutation or antiphospholipid antibodies are considered as the risk factor for the thrombosis asymptomatic woman. Woman with no brief personal history or risk factor for VTE, but who have a family history of unprofugged or estrogen preferred VTE in the first degree relative when age under 50 years should be considered for thrombophilia screening. This is about the thrombophilia screening. This is very important tables. It is about the summary of guidelines for thrombophilaxis in women with previous VTE and or thrombophilia. It is categorized in four according to the risk, very high risk, high risk, 
intermediate risk and low risk. So, the patient is called very high risk, is more than four antenatally, believe SVT on long term oral anticoagulant therapy. So, I recommend to give her a high dose of low molecular weight heparin at least six weeks and postnatal. Or until we switch it back to the oral anticoagulant therapy. So, we'll give her antenatal high dose low molecular weight heparin and at least six weeks postnatal. Or until we switch back to the oral anticoagulant therapy because most of this on long-term oral coagulation, anticoagulation. What about the high risk? If any previous VTE, except a single VTE related to the major surgery, he has recommended here antenatal, give her antenatal and six-week postnatal prophylactic lumeric Intermediate risk, asymptomatic high risk thrombophilia, homozygous factor V, Edens compound to zygous protein C or S deficiency. So recommended postnatal prophylactic lumetal heparin from for six weeks. Is the low risk here? Asymptomatic low risk thrombophilia, recommend 10 days if the other risk factor postpartum or six weeks if significant family history postnatal reflective thrombophilia. So this is about the summary of guideline. It's about the thrombophilaxis in women with previous VTE and or thrombophilia. Antiphospholipid antibodies, persistent antiphospholipid antibodies, lobus anticoagulant are anticardilibin and or P2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies in women without previous VTE should be considered as the risk factor for thrombosis. Such that if these have other risk factors, she may be considered for antenatal or postnatal thrombophlaxis as above. So antiphospholipid syndrome as uh, previously mentioned in the score risk for VTE, Table of the score score VTE. If there is previous VTE and associated with antiphospholipid syndrome, this is the four more than four antenatal score. This is about the obstetric prophylaxis risk assessment and management. Yeah, as the previous table, high risk, intermediate risk, this core or more risk or low risk. So here, any previous VTE except in single event related to the major surgery is classified as high risk. So we give antenatally and um, postnatal. And intermediate risk here, consider antenatal prophylaxis with low medical root heparin. This is of this in a hospital admission, single previous VTE related to the major surgery, high risk thrombophilia, and no VTE. Medical comorbidity, heart failure, SLE, and inflammatory bowel disease, and other disease, and any surgery proceed like a disectomy or a very high syndrome in the first trimester only. This is uh, intermediate risk and consider antenatal prophylaxis with low molecular Here, this is about if there's four or more risk factor, this is for flag is from the first trimester, if there's an obesity, as we have said, is uh, 30, BMI is 30 and more, give one a score one, and BMI more, more about 40 and more, we'll give a score two. Age more than 35, uh, it starts with 36, barati more than three, smoker, cross varicose vein, current preeclampsia, immobility, Family history of unprofogged of strategy related, uh, profogged VTE in first degree relative, or there's low risk thrombophilia, multiple pregnancy, uh, IVF, and ERT. This is patient with more is four or more risk factor will give reflexes from the first trimester. And three risk factor will start reflexes from 28 weeks. And if there's fewer than three, it's two or Less, this is the lower risk. I'm just advise her mobilization and avoidance of dehydration.
زي also the transient risk factors زي hydration hyperemesis gravidarum كان systemic infection um postnatal assessment any previous VTE any one require genital low molecular heparin high risk thrombophilia low risk thrombophilia plus family history this is the high risk will at least continue for six weeks and if there's severe sectional labor BMI more than 40 the admission or prolonged admission more than three days three or more than three days any surgical procedure in preparium uh, medical comorbidities this is classified as intermediate risk and at least 10 days postnatal prophylaxis to molecular heparin here if there's two or more will manage as intermediate if there's age more than 35 obesity more than 30 parity smoker elective cesarean section family history of vte low risk thrombophilia cross varicose vein current systemic infection immobility current preeclampsia multiple pregnancy preterm delivery in this pregnancy still birth in this pregnancy mid cavity rotational or operative vaginal delivery prolonged labor or postpartum hemorrhage if fewer than two this is classified as low risk and if two or more it is managed as intermediate risk this is about the obstetric thrombophilic district assessment and management during uh, pregnancy and after delivery or postnatal so in summary if there's various various vte low molecular weight heparin from early and is for risk factors throughout the remaining six six weeks postnatally if there's three factors will start low molecular weight heparin from 28 and will be continue six after delivery postnatal and if there's an admission low molecular weight heparin is unless contraindication or there's bleeding and for the ovarian hypertension syndrome there's mean low molecular heparin ivf low molecular weight heparin if three or other risk factor and hyperemesis gravidarum if admitted need for low molecular weight heparin this is summary about the obstetric assessment and many What about the timing for initiation of thromboplexis? This is, will be a summary for the previous table. Antenatal thromboplexis for those with previous VTE should begin as early in pregnancy as practical. Women is previous without previous VTE and without particular first trimester risk factor or admission to hospital, but with four others risk factor should be considered for antenatal prophylaxis through our cell pregnancy. Women with, without previous VTE and without particular first trimester risk factor or admission to the hospital, but the, with three other risk factor can start antenatal prophylaxis at 28 weeks of gestation. So if there's three, three risk factors, and there is no previous VTE and no particular ferris trimester risk factor like, like uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or hyperemesis gravidarum. So we'll start the, the low brain at 28 weeks of gestation. What about the ferris trimester risk factors? Women admitted with hyperemesis should be considered for the thromboflaxis with low molecular weight heparin and can discontinue thromboflaxis where the hyperemesis dissolves. So if the, the patient have hyperemesis gravidarum and admitted in the first trimester, so will give her thromboflaxis. Also, women with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome should be considered for thromboflaxis with low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester. So the patient have 
estrophation of uh, ovarian hypertrophic syndrome in the first trimester will give her thromboflexis. Also, women with IVF pregnancy and three other risk factors should be considered for thromboflexis with lumicate ovarian start in the first trimester. So if this patient have IVF pregnancy and the other risk three risk factors will start the thromboflexis with low microwave heparin from the first trimester. So this is about the first trimester risk factor. Thromboflexis during pregnancy and delivery, including the use of regional anesthesia. So this is about the relation of the thromboflexis to the regional anesthesia. Women receiving antenatal low microwave heparin should be advised that if they have any vaginal bleeding or once the labor begins, they should not inject any further low microwave heparin. So advise the woman patient on antilomicroid heparin, if this patient start in vaginal bleeding or start contraction or patient in labor should be stop the lomicroid heparin. So no other injection. Okay? So should stop the lomicroid heparin. Regional technique should be avoided if possible until at least 12 hours after the previous prophylactic dose of lomicroid heparin. If the patient have reflective dose of lomicotiberine, should be avoid the regional technique at least 12 hours after the last injection of reflective dose. And uh, therapeutic dose is about 24 hours. So we'll have a chart. We'll discuss this uh, clearly. <laughs> lomicotiberine should be should not be given for four hours after the use of spinal anesthesia or after epidural catheter has been removed. And the catheter should not be removed within 12 hours of the recent injection. When women present with while on therapeutic regimen of lumbricotiberine, regional technique should be avoided if possible for at least 24 hours after the last dose of lumicotiberine. So patient, if the patient have reflective low lumicotiberine and should be avoid the regional technique at least 12 hours, if the patient have therapeutic low lumicotiberine, should be avoid regional technique at least 24 hours. And if the patient have received injection about low lumicotiberine, should be avoid four hours after remove of the catheter or the spinal catheter. Look for this. This is about thromboflaxis to labor. Here, if the patient have, you see prophylactic on prophylactic lumicroid heparin, advise her to, if the patient for regional technique, should be avoided at least 12 hours. So patient have regional technique and patient reflect on reflective kilometer should be wait at least 12 hours. And after four hours from the regional technique, you can give her reflective low molecular heparin. So, and in case of patient with the cerebritic low molecular heparin, should be avoid regional technique at least 24 hours. At least 24 hours. And after the regional technique can give her reflective low heparin after four hours or after the removal of the cassette. And that about the treatment dose should become postponed eight to 12 hours later. Is it clear? What about women receiving antenatal lumicroid heparin?
C06 should be a thromboflactic dose of lomerucotiberin on the day prior to delivery and on the day of delivery, any morning dose should be omitted and the operation performed that morning. Women at high risk of hemorrhage with the risk factor including major anti antibartum hemorrhage, coagulopathy, progressive wound, hematoma, suspected intra-abdominal bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage may be managed with anti embolism stocking, food impulsive device or intermittent uh, pneumatics compression device, and fractionated heparin may be also considered. If a woman develop hemorrhagic problem while on low microtiberine, the treatment should be stopped and spread hematological advice stop. Rimboflaxis should be started or reinstituted as soon as the intermediate risk of the hemorrhage is reduced. So we need to continue evaluation for the patient. Thromboflaxis after delivery. So all women with class three obesity, BMI greater than equal to 40 kilogram should be considered for prophylactic clomethorib in dose appropriate for their weight for 10 days after delivery. So assess women after delivery and this, if the BMI more than 40 should be considered for prophylactic clomethorib. And women is two or more, but this is the risk factor listed in table one should be considered for low microtiberin and prophylactic dose appropriate for their weight for 10 days after delivery. What about the previous VTE? All women's previous history of confirmed VTE should be over it. Thromboflaxis with low microtiberin or warfarin for at least six weeks postpartum regardless of the mood of the delivery. So any patient have previous History of VTE should be over thromboflaxis with low molecular heparin or warfarin for at least six weeks regarding the mode of delivery. Asymptomatic thrombophilia, so in women with thrombophilia without previous VTE, should be stratified according to the post level of the risk associated with the thrombophilia and the presence or absence of a family history or the other risk factors. So here is the patient. Is the patient Asymptomatic thrombophilia should be looking for the other risk factors of VTE or if there's any family history. Women with family history of VTE and identified thrombophilia should be considered for six weeks postnatal thromboflaxis. So if the family history of VTE identified should be considered for six week postnatal thromboflaxis. about cesarean section. All women who have cesarean section should be considered for thromboflaxis with low molecular weight heparin for 10 days after delivery apart from those having elective cesarean section who should be considered for thromboflaxis with low molecular weight heparin for 10 days after delivery if they have any additional risk factors. So, case of cesarean section for 10 days after delivery. Thromboflaxis should be continued for six weeks in high-risk women and for 10 days intermediate risk. This is mentioned before in the previous table. In women who have additional bed resistance, lasting more than 10 days postpartum, risk factors should be such as prolonged admission, wound infection, or surgery in preprium, thromboflaxis should be extended for up to six weeks or until additional risk factor is or are no longer present. What agent should be used for thromboflaxis? There is many agents used in thromboflaxis like anti embolism stocking, low molecular weight heparin, and unfractionated heparin, and uh, warfarin, and oral thrombin, and aspirin. This is about patient use for thromboflaxis. 
لو ملك الويت هيبرين The low mercury heparin are the agent of choice for antenatal and postnatal thromboflaxis. This is the first one. And doses of low mercury heparin um, based on the weight, observation, we'll discuss later for a thromboflaxis. The booking or most recent weight can be used to guide dosing. It is only necessary to monitor in the platelet count if a woman had, had prior exposure to unfractionated heparin. So what about monitoring? Monitoring of NXA leaving is not required while local molecular heparin is used for thromboflaxis. So a patient on prophylactic dose, not only for monitoring of NXA leaving. Dose of low molecular heparin should be reduced in women with the renal impairment. And it is safe in breastfeeding. Here about suggested thromboflactic dose for antenatal and postnatal low molecular weight heparin. So here, the type of low molecular weight heparin and the according to the weight. Regarding the weight here, look for less than 50 kilogram, 50 to 90 kilogram, 91 to 130, Kilogram, one set to one to one seventy kilogram. This is about the weight, or more than one seventy kilogram. So here, this is the weight, and here, the drugs, spirin and delta barin and tizaparin. Here, about the dose. So, this is difficult to memorize this uh, table. I will give you a simple technique to write it easy. So if the weight here, less than 50, you can add it 40. You remember the other figures. So if you add it 40 here, it will be 50 to the 90. If you add it 4 here, it will be 91 to 130. If you add it 40 here, it will be 131 to 170. OK, if so, we'll add it 40. So here, the dose also have technique here to remember the dose. If the patient less than 50, the dose of exoparin is 20 milligram day. This is a prophylaxis dose. 20 milligram day. If the patient uh, weight is 50 kilogram. So what about the patient is 50 to 90 kilogram? So it is 40 milligram day. Here we'll add it 40. Here we'll add it. So here we'll add it 20, sorry. Here we'll add it 40. 92 and 130 kilogram. Here, 60. So we'll increase 20, 20. Here, 20, 40, 60, 80. Here we'll increase 40, 40, 40. 90, 130, 170. So this is easy to remember during the exam. And Regarding the delta barine dose, here yeah, we'll add it 2500. Look here with the dose. If this here we add it for 50, here this 50 kilogram. The delta barine, the dose is 20, uh, 2500 units daily. Okay. And if added for here 50 to 90, we'll increase the dose for 5,000. And here, 91 to 130, 7,500 units per day, daily. And here, 131 to 170, here, 10,000 units daily. So increase here, start with 2,500. So you can add it 2,500 here, double. It will be double, okay? Uh, 5,000. 5, if you increase 2,500, will be 7,500. Here, if you added these figures, 2,500 will be 10,000. About regarding the dose of tinder barin, here, the dose here is double it here. Here. 
uh, in case of 50 kilogram will be 3,500 units daily and double it here. It is 700 units. And in case of patient have 50 to 90 kilogram, the dose here 4,500 units per day and double it here in 130 to 170 kilogram will be 9,000 units per day. So remember this. Here we'll add it 40, and in case of Nizubarin, we'll add it 20, according to the first here, 40, 60, 80. Delta Barin will add it 2,500, we'll start with 2,500, 500, 5,000, 7,500, 10,000. Here, we'll double here, 3,500, 3, will be doubled in case of 91 to the 130, and for 5,500 will be double here in case of the weight is 131 to 170 kilogram. Okay, is it clear? If the weight more than 170 kilogram, Zubarin 0.6 milligram per kilogram per kilogram per day, and Delta Barin is 75 units kilogram per day, and also the same like Delta Barin and Tinza Barin is. 75 unit kilogram per day. So in case of high prophylactic dose for women weighing 50 to 90 kilogram, it's 4 kilogram, 12 hourly, 5,000 unit, 12 hourly. And in case of tins of barine, it's 4,500 uh, 4, unit per 12 hourly. So in case, yeah, the, this is the recall question asked about a uh, case of 90 patient half weight 91 and set 130 kilogram and asking about the dose of nixubarin or the dose of delta barin. So this is the answer is 60 milligram per day or in case of delta barin is 7,500 unit daily. This is about the suggested thromboflactic dose for antenatal and postnatal low molecular weight heparin. Unfractionated heparin in women at very risk of thromboflagis, unfractionated heparin may be used peripartum in preference of low molecular heparin, where there is increased risk of hemorrhage or where the general anesthesia technique may be required. If unfractionated heparin is used after cesarean section or other surgery, the platelet count should be monitored every two to three days from day for and until day 14 or until heparin is stopped. Uh, tanaproids, potential use of tanaproids should be in conjunction with consultant hematologist with expertise in hemostasis and pregnancy. So the use of the tanaproids should be in the conjunction with uh, and consultant hematologist have experience in hemostasis and pregnancy. And Fundabrenex is Fundabrenex should be reserved for women in tronate of heparin compound. It is used in pregnancy should be in conjunction with a consultant hematologist with expertise in hemostasis in pregnancy. What about the low dose spleen? Spirit is not recommended for thromboflaxis in obstetric patient. And warfarin, warfarin used in pregnancy is restricted to the few situations when heparin is considered unsuitable. Example for some women is mechanical heart valve. So we'll continue. Warfarin, women receiving long term anticoagulant with warfarin and be converted from. Lomericoid heparin to warfarin postpartum when the risk of hemorrhage is reduced, usually five, seven days after the And warfarin is safe in breastfeeding. Antibolisms, talking, the use 
of properly applied antibolism of stocking of upper waist size and providing graduated compression with calf pressure of 14 to 15 millimeter mercury is recommended in pregnancy and the preperium for women who have hospital and have contraindication to the So if the patient has low risk or less than two risk factors, this is can use antibolism stocking. This include women who have hospitalized post cesarean section combined with lomocotiburin and considering to be particularly high risk of VTE, example for previous VTE and more than four risk factor antenatally or more than two risk factor postnatally. And women traveling long distance for more than four hours. This is the indication of antibolism stocking. Yeah, what is about in the contraindication for lomocotiburin? Is this non bleeding disorder like hemophilia, prone disease, and this active antenatal or postnatal bleeding? Women considered at risk of major hemorrhage in case of placenta previa, thrombocytopenia, and acute drug and severe renal disease or severe level disease or uncontrolled hypertension. This is the contraindication or should be used as caution for low milk weight brain. This is about the reducing risk of VTE. Okay, the second guideline is thromboembolic disease in pregnancy and in a preprium, the acute management. VTE remain one of the main direct cause of maternal death in the UK. The prevalence of ultimately diagnosed BE in pregnant women and with suspected B is two to six percent. The majority of women with VTE in pregnancy have clinical symptom. The symptom of DVT, the, if the woman have leg pain, swelling, usually unilaterals, a lower abdominal pain, or this is about the main symptom of DVT. Symptom of BE dyspnea, chest pain, hemostasis, and collapse. Low-grade pyrexia and leukocytosis can occur with VTE. This table shows the differential diagnosis of maternal collapse in case of pulmonary embolism, how to differentiate between pulmonary embolism and amniotic fluid plus and caesar or eclampsia or the hemorrhagic causes here is about the differential diagnosis and the important clinical feature of each of the one. Uh, pulmonary embolism, there is massive pulmonary embolism causing collapse and associated with central chest pain. This is very important presentation. And onset is usually sudden and associated with the pressless And maybe associated with hemoptysis, sinus tachycardia, and raised GVB and sign of right heart strain. The risk is higher in obese older women for both cesarean section or surgery and in those with previous VTE or thrombophilia. So this is about the clinical feature or the bottom clinical feature of the presentation of PE. Uh, investigation is very important here. Just X-ray, ECG, and arterial blood gases, and ventilation, perforation, lung scan, and SATABA, and pulmonary angiography or echocardiogram. And about the amniotic fluid embolism, it typically occurred during or immediately following the labor with intact membrane, intact amniotic sac. And also just chest X-ray, you can do chest X-ray and coagulation profile. About 
eclampsia, stomach colic, seizure, presentation, and hemorrhage. You need to do full blood count, coagulation, studies, and fibrinogen. It also is about the pneumonia, uh, pneumothorax, and the acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection. How to differentiate between BE and because a lot of scenario came in exam uh, to you should answer the, this question with differentiate between the BE and the amniotic fluid embolism and the clamps. What about the diagnosis of VTE, acute VTE? Any woman with symptom or signs suggested of VTE should be have objective testing and treatment of low molecular heparin given until the diagnosis is secluded by objective testing unless treatment is strongly, strongly contraindication. So this is very important because it's in exam came in a lot of question ask about the after before the diagnosis of VTE, if there's any suspicion. So we'll start first with the investigation, then can give her the lumicoid heparin. So investigation first before starting the management. If the VT remain untreated, 15 to 24% of this patient will develop BE. So DVT is high risk for developing BE. So if untreated, it's about 15 to 24% will develop as BE. So that is why we'll start immediately a low molecular weight brain. And pulmonary embolism to urine pre pregnancy must be fatal on almost 15% of the patient. And in 66 of this, this will occur with insert minutes of the embolism ever. So this is the prognosis of BE because a lot of patients die with 30 minutes. So you need to give the patient immediately low molecular weight heparin. So here a blood should be taken for the full blood count, coagulation screen, urea and electrolyte and liver function test. This is very important because uh, mentioned in the previous table about the contraindication of low, low molecular weight heparin. So We'll investigate for full blood count, coagulation profile, urea and electrolyte and liver function test. What about the investigation? If there's any suspicion about the pressure complex ultrasound should be undertaken where there is clinical suspicion of DVT. So if any suspicion of DVT, you Paris will do investigation like full blood count, coagulation, profile, urea, and electrolyte, and low function test, and start therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. Then you can do investigation to diagnose DVT. So we'll, here we'll start with the compression duplex ultrasound investigation. So if ultrasound is negative and there is low level of clinical suspicion, anticoagulant treatment should be discontinued. If you do duplex ultrasound and negative and this low level of clinical suspicion, top low molecular heparin. If ultrasound is negative and there is high, high level of clinical suspicion, anticoagulant Treatment can be discontinued, but the ultrasound should be repeated on day three and day seven. If ultrasound is negative and there is still there is high suspicion of DVT, so stop the anticoagulant treatment, but you should repeat the duplex ultrasound in day three and day four. Day seven, sorry, day seven. If repeat in day three and day seven and is still negative, no need for treatment. If repeated testing confirms the presence of DVT, anticoagulant treatment should be recommended and continued. So if 
positive or this confirmed DVT, you should recommend it to do to give her anticoagulant. Woman presenting with symptom and sign of acute pulmonary embolism should have ECG chest X-ray performed. ECG should can be abnormal in 41% of women with acute PE. So ECG is important in case of pulmonary embolism because there's many change here. This is the recall question came in February 2020. At the most type of the ECG change is T wave inversion, however, 21%, and also CA1, S1, and Q3, T3, parents is about 15%, and right bundle branch plug is about 18%. It's about ECG change in case of PE, and chest X-ray may identify other pulmonary diseases such as pneumonia, pneumothorax, or labor lower collapse. This is to differentiate other type of cause chest pain or dyspnea, like pneumonia, pneumothorax, or lower collapse. This is about table show, algorithm show investigation and initial management of suspected DVT in pregnancy and preperium. So in case of suspected DVT, here is two clinical assessment. Take the history and the, the examination, then blood test, very important, for blood count, urea, liver function test, coagulation profile, and then commence low medical weight heparin. After that, you can prefer uh, patient duplex ultrasound. So, Ultrasound, if this is positive, confirm DVT, continuous therapeutic dose of lumocathibarin. If the ultrasound negative, discontinue of therapeutic dose of lumocathibarin. But if there is still high suspicion of DVT, consider alternative repeat testing on day three and day seven. This is mentioned before. Here about uh, algorithm about the investigation and management of patient or BE in during pregnancy and preparing. If suspected BE, this the scenario suspected BE also will do history and examination, perform chest X-ray because to exclude the other like pneumonia and pneumothorax a lower collapse and ECG, there's many, maybe ECG change and test for full blood count, urea, electrolyte, liver function test and coagulation profile and commence low molecular weight heparin. Okay. If symptom and sign of DVT, here perform the patient to black ultrasound. If ultrasound confirm, continue therapeutic dose. But they, if there is no symptom and sign of DVT and chest X-ray is normal, perform VQ scan. This is the question in February 2020. Question exam. If chest X-ray is abnormal, perform subtle. So if B is confirmed, continuous therapeutic dose of leomycotiberin. If not confirmed, and if there is clinical suspicion of B is low, discontinue leomycotiberin and consider alternative diagnosis. If this suspicion is high, consider alternative or repeat testing and continue leomycotiberin. This is about the management of suspected DVT. Here, this is the same as previous. Woman suspected VT and symptom 
of DVT should be by lateral compression to plex ultrasound perform it. If the confirmed DVT, then no further investigation is necessary and treatment of v for VTE should continue. Woman with suspected BE without sign of symptom of DVT should have VQ scan or SATABA perform it. When the chest X-ray is abnormal, SATABA should be performed in the present is reference to VQ scan. So if the chest, chest X-ray is abnormal, we'll do SATABA. Alternative of repeat testing should be carried out where VQ scan or SATABA is normal, but the clinical suspicion of BE remain with anticoagulant treatment continuing until BE is excluded definitely. SATABA more readily available and lower risk, but associated with increased risk of breast cancer. And VQ scanning may carry a slight risk for childhood cancer, but is associated with lower risk of maternal breast cancer in both situations the absolute risk is very small. So, SATABA is increased risk of breast cancer and VQ have slightly increased risk of childhood cancer. This is the differentiation between SATABA and VQ. D-dimer testing should not be performed in investigation of acute VT in pregnancy. And this progressive rise in D-dimer level with advancing pregnancy becoming abnormal at term and in the postnatal period in health woman. It is increased further in multiple pregnancies, post cesarean section and major postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia. A negative D-dimer is inadequate to exclude PE in pregnancy. So have no role in case of DVT or VTE in pregnancy. This is a table about differentiation between SATABA and VQ scanning, advantage and disadvantage. Here lower dose of radiation to the fetus, beta sensitivity and specificity to the VQ scan can detect it other pathology. Example, aortic section, readily available. And disadvantage have high dose radiation to the breast cancer, so I have a risk of breast cancer with 13 to 0.6 percent increased risk lifetime of developing breast cancer and may miss a small peripheral BE. In VQ scan, lower dose of radiation to the breast cancer, the ventilation scan can often be omitted for the lowering the radiation dose, high negative predictive value. This advantage high dose or addition to the fetus, the scan may be delayed because of availability of isotope. Baseline blood investigation. Blood should be taken for full blood count, coagulation screen, urea and electrolytes, and liver function test prior to anticoagulant trip. So the formin a thrombophilia screen is not recommended. In the pregnant and non-pregnant, the presence of thrombophilia does not hurt management of acute VT. So not recommended to screen for thrombophilia. In pregnancy, protein C or protein S, an antithrombo level may fall as well as a guard activated protein C resistance. So here, important here, investigation here, full blood count, coagulation, screen, urea and electrolyte and liver function prior to start anticoagulant therapy. The initial anticoagulant treatment, in clinically suspected DVT, VE, BE treatment with low mercury should be commenced immediately until the diagnosis is excluded by objective testing unless treatment is strongly contraindicated. So 
a low molecular weight heparin should be given in those titrate against the woman booking or early pregnancy weight. There should be clear local guideline for those. This is about the initial anticoagulant treatment. Here, talk about the initial dose of ritubarine determined as follow. First, we talk about the prophylactic dose. Here, we talk about the therapeutic dose. In the case of exuberine and delta barine and in the bed. In exuberine, therapeutic dose starts with a patient weight less than 50, 50 to 9, 72, 89, 90 to 109, 110 to 125, more than 25. Here, We'll add it 20 for the body weight, pregnancy weight here, because it's difficult to memorize all this table, but we can just memorize the first one and the added 20 here, 52. Here, if you add it 20, it's about 52, 96, 72, 89, so and so on. Okay. And the initial dose of Zubari can also add it. 20 here because in case of less than 50 kilogram it's 40 milligram twice daily or 60 milligram once daily so in case of twice daily you you will add it 40 for the other for the next dose and we'll add it in case of once per day we'll add it for sale so here we'll add it 20 50 to 69 and the dose, initial dose of nitzubarine will add it 10 to 20 to 40, will be uh, 60 milligram twice dead. Or will add 30, will be 90. Yeah. We'll add 30 for 60 here, we'll add 20 for uh, 40. So here will be 90. Okay, milligram once day. Uh, in case of pregnancy weight is 70 to 89 kilogram. So we added 20 to 60, here will be 80 milligram twice daily. Or we'll add it 30 to 90, will be 120 milligram once daily. And in case of 90 to 109 kilogram, will be 100 milligram twice daily or 150 milligram once daily. And in case of pregnant weight is 110 to 225 kilogram will be 20 milligram twice daily or 180 milligram once daily. In case of more than 125 milligram, discuss with hematologist. This is about the dose, therapeutic dose of an exuberine. Here we'll add it 20 for the weight. And if you give the patient twice, we'll add it 20 to the 40. If the patient once per day, we add it plus set. In case of delta barium, the initial dose in case of less than 50 kilograms is of about 5,000 international twice daily or 10,000 international unit once daily. So in twice, 5,000. Once, 10,000. So, and from 50 to 69 kilograms, here, the initial dose will be 6,000 international twice daily or 12,000 international once daily. So here, we'll add it. One plus one thousand for the dose less than fifty, and the dose with fifty to the sixty-nine kilogram, and added plus two thousand for the dose fifty to eighty-nine and ninety to one thousand nine. We'll add it here will be eight eight thousand will be here six thousand, and we'll add it two thousand here. 
okay? And we'll add it 1,000 for less than 50 kilogram will be 6,000. Here we'll double. Here, once a day, we'll double 10,000, 12,000, 60,000, 20,000 international units. And in case of 110 to 125 kilogram, so 12,000 international twice daily or 24,000 international daily. So here will be double. If once, if the five will double it, 10,000, 6,000 will be 12,000, 8,000 will be 16,000, 10,000 will be 20,000. 20, so this is, will be easy to remember during this exam. In case of tinzaparin, initial dose of tinzaparin is about 1.5 unit per kilogram once day, according to the code rate. Lower dose should be used if creatinine clearance less than 20 to 30 mil per minute. So renal function test is very important. Routine as measurement of peak and XA activity is not recommended except in women at extreme of body weight, less than 50 kilogram and 90 kilogram or more, or with other complicating factors, renal impairment or the current VTE. And the routine bladder count monitoring should not be carried out. So no benefit to do routine bladder count. Obstetric patients who have a bus operative and receiving unfractionated heparin should have bladder count monitoring performed every two to three days from day four to day 14 or until heparin is stopped, as mentioned before. Collapsed and shocked women who are pregnant or in perium should be assessed by a team of experienced clinician, including the on-call consultant of situation. So any patient have collapsed or shocked woman should be assessed by a senior consultant because to differentiate it is this is a monetic fluid embolism or this is a BE or this is eclampsia, the other cause of collapse, internal collapse. CBR should be performed in the left lateral position. A pre-mortem cesarean section should be performed by five minutes if the suscitation is unsuccessful and the blindness is more than 20 weeks. So this is about pre-mortem cesarean section. Women should be managed on individual basis regarding IV and fracturated heparin thrombolytic therapy or thoracotomy or surgical envelope. Management should involve a multidisciplinary team, including senior physician, obstetrician, and radiologist. Intravenous fractionated uh, brain is preferred initial treatment in massive pulmonary embolism with cardiovascular promise. So we we'll prefer to use intravenous and fractionated heparin in case of massive BE, massive BE. And the on-call medical team should be tacted immediately urgent portable echograms or set up within one hour of presentation should be arranged. If massive BE is confirmed or extremes circumstance prior to confirmation immediate thrombolysis should be considered. So this is about how to manage the patient of massive life threatening BE. So multidisciplinary team and infraction heparin and sataba and portable echo should be provided in one hour of presentation and measure the ABTT uh, four to six hours after loading dose and six hours after any dose change and they are in therapeutic range. Additional therapies in the initial management of DVT, the leg should be elevated and created elastic patient stocking applied to reduce edema. Mobilization should be incorrect. Consideration should be given to the use of temporary inferior vena cable filters 
in the prepartum period for the patient with iliac vein BTE to reduce the risk of BE or in patient with proven DVT and who have recurrent VTBE despite adequate antibiotics. The main complication of IVC filters or the inferior vena cava filters are migration or increased risk of lower limb DVT, cavel thrombosis, and rarely infection. It's about the complication of IVC filter. How to maintain the treatment for VTE? Treatment with therapeutic dose of subcutaneous lumbricoid heparin should be applied during the remainder of the pregnancy and for the at least six weeks postnatal and until at least three months of treatment has been given in total. So we should provide therapeutic dose postnatal. Our patient follow up should include clinical assessment advice with monitoring of blood platelet and big NTXA level and if appropriate. So to maintain between 0.5 to 1.2 unit per ml. Brigner woman who develop heparin, diabetic thrombocytopenia or have heparin allergy and require continuing anticoagulant therapy should be managed with alternative anticoagulant. Some, for example, is done applied under specialist advice. Because of their adverse effect on the fetus, vitamin K antagonists, such as warfarin, should not be used for antenatal VTE treatment to avoid warfarin fetal syndrome. Anticoagulant therapy during labor and delivery. When VTE occurs at term, consideration should be given to the use of IVF and fractionated heparin. Women with low liquid heparin for maintenance therapy should be advised not to inject any further heparin once it's established in labor. Low liquid heparin should be discontinued 24 hours prior to the plan delivery and subcutaneous and fractionated heparin should be discontinued 12 hours before the plan delivery. And intravenous and fractionated heparin should be discontinued six hours before plan delivery. So low molecular heparin should be discontinued 24 hours. This is therapeutic low molecular heparin. And subcutaneous and fractionated the body should be discontinued 12 hours before planned delivery. And intravenous unfractionated heparin, six hours before planned delivery. Regional IGC should be avoided at least 24 hours after the last dose of therapeutic low molecular heparin. A low molecular heparin should not be given for four hours after spinal or after the epidural catheter has been removed. This should not be re removed within for 12 hours of the most recent injection. And a thrombophlactic dose of lomocotarabine should be given four hours post-operatively, and the treatment dose recommended eight to 12 hours later. In patient receiving a therapeutic dose of lumbricoid heparin, wound train should be considered at cesarean section and the skin incision should be closed with interrupted suture to allow the drainage of any hematoma. And the incidence of wound hematoma is 0.1 percent. This is chart about the low molecular heparin regional anesthesia and removal catheter. In case of prophylactic low molecular heparin, so induction of labor cesarean section and regional technique should be avoided at least 12 hours 
in case of prophylactic lomocortiparine. In patients have received thrombotic lomocortiparine, should be avoid the general technique at least 24 hours. After the regional technique or the cesarean section or induction of labor, we can start the prophylactic lomocortiparin after four hours. After four hours. So here the treatment dose should be uh, between eight to start between eight to 12 hours later. So this is about the lomocortiparin related to the regional anesthesia and catheter removal. Here, in case of regional anesthesia and removal of catheter, if the patient have received prophylactic low molecular weight heparin, should be avoid the regional anesthesia at least 12 hours. And in patient have received therapeutic low molecular weight heparin, should be avoid regional anesthesia at least 24 hours. And in case of regional analgesia, we'll start the prophylactic lomocortiparin at after four hours. After four hours. In case of patient have received prophylactic lomocortiparin, you can you cannot remove the catheter before twelve hours. You can wait more than. 12 hours here, 12 hours to remove the catheter. And after remove the catheter, after four hours, you can give her prophylactic low mercury So regarding the removal of the uh, catheter, if the patient receive reflective dose, should wait more than 12 hours. And after removal of the catheter, should more wait more than hours to give the patient prophylactic this is about the relationship between regional anesthesia and removal of the catheter regarding to the prophylactic low mercury or therapeutic more low mercury Any woman who is considered to be high risk of hemorrhage should be managed with IVA and fractionated heparin until the risk factor for hemorrhage have been resolved. Postnatal anticoagulant, women should be over a choice of lomocortiparin or oral anticoagulant for postnatal therapy after discussion about the need for regular blood test for monitoring of warfarin, particularly during the first 10 days of treatment. Postpartum warfarin should be avoided until at least the day, the fifth day, and the for longer in women with increased risk of pulmonary of risk of the postpartum hemorrhage. Neither heparin or warfarin are contraindication in breastfeeding. Prolonged use of low mercury heparin more than 12 weeks is associated with significantly lower chance of developing post-thrombotic thrombro. Persistent leg swelling, pain, feeling of heaviness, pain, cyanosis, Disease, chronic pigmentation, eczema, varicose vein, venous serration. Postnatal review for patients who develop VTE during pregnancy or the preparium should be at obstetric medicine clinic or join of obstetric hematology clinic. Thrombophilia testing should be performed once anticoagulant therapy has been discontinued on only if the result would influence future minute. This is all about the two guidelines. Any question? Hello. Hello, Dr. Bishbe. Hello, Dr. Fath. How are you doing? 
welcome fine hamdulillah mm-hmm. yeah sorry i couldn't attend partly because i'm on call uh, i just wanted to ask one thing like if there is a patient uh, with the high suspicion of dvt and uh, first ultrasound is a uh, duplex uh, doppler is normal so we will continue with the dose but still the suspicion is high and we will repeat the doppler on day 3 is it yes if this <clears throat> the patient uh, doppler is negative and just x ray is abnormal will do sataba okay if this confirm dvt will start the lumicovit heparin okay it will start will start dominic return because already as ultrasound duplex ultrasound is negative and if there is clinically high suspicion will do duplex ultrasound in day 3 and day 7 if okay. it's still negative will uh, will uh, not Stop start dominic return yes yes if there is positive okay. will continue dominic okay okay thank you so much thank you and volunteer for hello hello doctor amtran hello yes doctor just now <laughs> i join you but i will try inshallah what about your duty i have a very hard uh, duty very hard alhamdulillah <laughs> okay Okay. okay i think uh most of you are uh, busy and uh, duty of uh, I, i i will post the report for you on the website okay thank you thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank you, thank you.